Anyway, welcome to VoIPCOM for email addresses. This gentleman behind me is Josh. He'll be talking a little bit today, so please welcome him and thank you. All right, all right. Awesome. So before we get started, um, we're going to do a live demo at the end. So I got my Twitter handle up here. Send me email addresses that you guys are OK with querying up on a screen. So don't send me anything like that you don't want up on a screen or like live stream later. Um, if you got like an attacker email or like a you know, pen testing email or even your own personal email that you're OK with, send me a Twitter DM and then we'll, we'll query some live and then go through the results. Um, sweet. So I'm Josh. This is my first public speaking engagement. Um, so I'm like super excited to be here and share what we've been working on for the past year. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so real quick, who's seen Blade Runner? All right, who knows what a VoIP comp test is? All right, so not everybody. So real quick, a VoIP comp test is a test to determine whether an individual is human or a replicant. And for us, we, we've kind of taken that, and we are determining whether an email address is legitimate or fake. So that's kind of the analysis with here today. So just a real quick bio. So uh, currently the founder and CEO of Sublime Security. Uh, formerly, I have a, a been basically doing offensive cyber-related work for most of my career. Um, some government work in there, a um, bunch of pen testing, uh, lots of phishing engagements, spent some time at NIST doing IR and forensic work, um, studied CS at UMD. Any Terps in the room? Any Terps, a few, nice, all right. Um, did a lot of martial arts most of my life and uh, played way too much Halo, way too much Halo. Um, all right, quick, uh, quick overview of what we're gonna be talking about today. So we're gonna start off really briefly with the background and motivation for email rep, like why do we care about it specifically? Um, we'll, we'll get into why, what email reputation is and why you should care about it. And then this is where we're gonna spend most of our time, the technical deep dive. So we're gonna break down exactly how we built email rep. And the goal of that is gonna be so that you can build it yourself. Uh, we're gonna give you all the lessons learned. Uh, we're gonna talk about our challenges and all the different data, data sources and inputs into our work. We'll talk about some of our future work that we're really excited about and then we're gonna do a, a live demo at the end. So, Background and motivation. So um, we're Sublime. We're building an open email security platform. So we have a query language that lets you define attacker behavior. So when a message comes into your environment, we tokenize that. We break it down into all these different parts. And then we enrich it. We do things like domain enrichments, IP enrichments, file enrichments. Have we seen anything before on these different pieces of metadata? And what we realize is like, what about email addresses? You know, like we have all these different things that we're looking at to determine um, whether something is you know, suspicious, why don't we do anything about email addresses? Ian Teal once said, when someone's accused of a crime, you look at the person who committed the crime, their prior history, who they are, not just the crime they committed. So why aren't we doing the same thing with email? We're looking at the links in the email, we're looking at the attachments, but we're not really looking at the sender. What do we know about that email address that's sending the, sending the message? So that's the impetus. That's, that's, how, that's the inception story of how we started talk, thinking about email reputation. So what is email rep and what is email reputation? Let's break that down. So email rep is a free API to query email reputation and report bad behavior. So we released emailrep.io and you can see on the right side here a sample response. We'll go through and we'll break down each one of these uh, elements of the response and what that means. But just so you get an idea of what we're talking about here. Now you may be thinking to yourself, now what's email reputation? I've never heard of that before, maybe you have. Um, so let's break that down. So we have, we have reputation, right? If we define reputation, we have the overall quality or character as seen or judged by people in general. So that's kind of abstract. Now let's apply that to email reputation. It's the overall character of an email address as seen or judged by internet history and activity. That's how we define it. So we break reputation down into a few different levels. We got high and, high and no reputation. Those are the extremes. High reputation means that there's a lot of good behavior and no bad behavior, or at least no bad recent behavior. And no reputation means that we haven't seen anything 
um, no, no history or anything, you know, no presence regarding this email address out on the internet. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean you're bad, but it's risky. Normal people who own normal email addresses have reputation assigned with, uh, you know, associated with those email addresses. That's just the way the web works, right? You're, you're around, you're, you're, you're registering profiles for different sites, and there's data breaches, and like, there's all these little internet breadcrumbs for email addresses. And then we have a couple levels in between. We have uh, low and medium. And we'll dig into this a little bit more. So why now? Why now? I'm preaching to the choir here, but we all know phishing is a, a big fucking problem. It's on the rise, and phishing defense is hard. Attackers are getting more sophisticated. They're evolving. Um, their phishing kits are, are, are cheap and widely available. There was a great talk this morning about phishing kits and how they're you know, more sophisticated and more widely available. Um, attackers are passing SPF, DKIM, and DMARC. So as defenders, we're left with less tools to actually determine um, you know, legitimacy or uh, malice. And to you put a cherry on top, legit companies are failing SPF. Twitter, Amex, I mean, all these big companies can't even pass SPF themselves. Um, so it's a problem on the defensive side. Um, free email providers don't have domain reputation to go off of. So what do you have to go off of when it comes to senders? So that's, that's kind of part of the inception story and why it's relevant now to us. So we're gonna focus specifically on the phishing defense application of email reputation. There's a lot of other applications to it, and, and we'll touch on some of those a bit later in the talk, but the large, major large majority of the talk is gonna be focused on phishing defense. So we're gonna break this down into two, two particular use cases here. The first one is an email address that is created to conduct a new campaign. So there are, there are many reasons why you might do this. Um, you, may, you might wanna create a target specific email address, you know, like to impersonate somebody working at the company. You may you know, just wanna create a new email address that has um, no connection to your um, prior campaigns. Um, so there's lots of reasons. We do this all the time uh, you know, as red teamers. We create new accounts. <laughs> This is, one, this is the use case that email rep is really good at. Um, there's, no, there's no history behind this email address. So we're gonna dig into this. Um, let's start with a couple examples so we can get a feel for like what this, you know, what this is like. So um, who thinks that this is my actual email address? All right, we got a couple, we got a couple in the back. Who thinks that this is my actual email address? Okay. And lastly, who thinks that this is my actual email address? Nice, nice. Okay, uh, who thought the first one was again? All right, uh, sorry to say you guys are wrong. This email address is risky. This is what the output looks like on emailrep.io. So we have not observed this email address on the internet. It's from a free provider and has no profiles on major services like LinkedIn, Facebook, and iCloud. Who thought the second email is my email? Okay. You're also wrong. Sorry to say. And we have a similar response here. It's hard, it's hard right? Like we're talking about, like how do you know? How do you know just by looking at an email address? And who thought the third one was mine? Nice, nice, all right. You're also wrong. <laughs> None of these are my email, right? And like, this one's not even deliverable, right? Like, so it's really hard to tell just by looking at an email address. So that's the point. That's the point we're trying to make here. It's really hard. Um, this is my actual email address. It has high reputation. It's been seen in 17 reputable sources on the internet, and it has Profiles on well-known sites like Twitter, Flickr, Spotify. We've seen it since 2012 and as recent as 2019. So there's a lot of history behind this email address, right? We can't definitively say that it's mine, right? But we can say that this is associated with a person. All right, and the second uh, application in phishing defense use case is compromised email addresses. So these are high reputation emails, like mine, that have been taken over and are temporally bad. 
So this is actually a lot more difficult to get right, and we'll talk about what we're doing to address that and, and how we do that. All right, so um, let's get into the technical deep dive now. So again, point of this is uh, to, to literally be able to build this yourself afterwards and, and uh, tell you guys what all the lessons that we learned building this and mistakes we made. All right, so let's break down the positive and negative inputs here. So on the positive side, we're looking at things like social media profiles, business-related profiles, domain age, how many years, if it's a custom domain, how many years has it been around? Uh, this obviously doesn't help us for free email providers, though. Uh, data breaches, so we are using the existence in a data breach as a positive source of reputation. Credential leaks, again, these are hard to fake, so we use these as, as positive sources. Domain reputation and associations with high reputation. So we may not necessarily know that that email address is high reputation, but maybe we were able to correlate that with another email that has high reputation or a domain that has high reputation. And so we'll dig into exact, like some ways that we do that. Um, and then negative inputs. So um, have we seen it send phishing emails or, fraud, or con commit fraud? Spam, spam, has, has it um, been sending spam or spamming login forms? Uh, community reports, so we'll talk about the crowdsourcing efforts we have. Um, phishing kits, is it part of, you know, have we seen it part of a phishing kit, a threat actor? Was the domain age re registered recently? Um, was it in a recent data breach or a recent credential leak? Those are actually much more suspicious. Is it even deliverable? Is it spoofable? These are all things that we're looking at, and they're all inputs. So we'll break each one of these down on exactly how we do that. So data breaches. There's no shortage of data breaches out on the internet. Um, if you want, you can take a picture of the slide, or I'll send it to you afterwards. Like, if you want to build this, there's so many sources for data breaches. We're using a few of them in here. Um, we love Have I Been Pwned. Shout out to Troy Hunt. Uh, who is? This one's pretty straightforward. So um, we use who is to get domain age. Now the lesson here is that if you want to do this yourself, you will get rate limited at volume. So uh, if, you, if you have high volume, you will either get blacklisted or you'll get rate limited. So we use um, who is XML API for this. They're all right. They're all right. Um, if anyone has any better alternatives, let me know. Um, the cheaper or, or cheaper ones. Uh, DNS. So uh, we we use DNS for a bunch of things. So is it even a valid domain? You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. Um, does it have an MX record? You'd think this is pretty straightforward, um, but you'd be surprised again. Um, we look at uh, SPF and DMARC records. Um, and the reason we do that is to determine whether it's spoofable. Um, we obviously can't, we can't tell you whether the email is spoofed, right? We don't have the headers. But we can at least look at the enforcement on SPF and DMARC to give you a likelihood to tell you that it's even spoofable. Like if you're, if you're receiving your inbox or your spam, what, what, can you, what, what do you do about that? Uh, and then we're doing some cool stuff with text records. So we're looking for the presence of things that would denote high reputation. So um, things like email automation platforms or email you know, marketing platforms, SendGrid and MailChimp and like things that you would have to pay money for that an attacker is not really likely to do. We're looking at those types of things and those are inputs into reputation. SMTP, so we're using this to determine deliverability. A Gmail account that is not deliverable is suspicious. Why is it not deliverable if it's sending email? Doesn't make sense. Uh, and Google will actually tell you whether something, an email address is deliver, deliverable or not. And we'll, we'll break that down on how you can do that. So you can roll your own for this. Um, but there are some challenges there. There are challenges especially at scale. Uh, and and uh, we'll break that down in a second. We use Kickbox right now. They're pretty good, but they're, they're expensive. So um, we're, we're using them right now, but we're gonna, we're gonna rebuild our own service for this. But we're using them now because we wanna ensure quality results. So um, you can definitely build your own. 
Um, just be aware that there's some limitations, and, and we'll talk about what those are right now. So it's pretty straightforward to determine deliverability via SMTP. So you can just connect to the mail server, and it'll tell you in most cases. So the first thing we'll do is do an MX record lookup on sublimesecurity.com. And we'll pull, we'll, we can see that we're using um, G Suite here. So this is the G Suite MX record, mail gateway. And then we will connect directly to the mail gateway on part 25 for SMTP, and we'll conduct a, uh, an exchange. And we'll say hello, and we'll say mail from, doesn't matter what you put here. And most importantly, recipient to josh at sublimesecurity.com. And you can see that the next, the response from Google here is a 250 OK. So this is Google saying, yes, this is a valid email address. Now let's break down what it looks like when it's an invalid email. We do the same handshake, and this time we have an invalid at sublimesecurity.com, and Google's nice enough to give us a 550 saying that the email account that you tried to reach does not exist. Pretty straightforward. There's, there's libraries for this. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. But there are some things that you should be aware of if you're doing this at scale. Um, you will get rate limited. You will get blacklisted. There are some challenges with SSL. Um, most importantly, there is some undetermined behavior by some email gateways. So Microsoft will literally return a random result 1% of the time. I have no fucking clue why this happens, um, but you, will li you can literally, every one out of 100 requests, it will literally tell you that an, a, an email is deliverable when it's not. Uh, and there are, some, there are cases like this across the internet. There are mail gateways that have undefined behavior. So if you don't know this a priori, then you'll get inconsistent results. So um, Kickbox has done this work for us, and that's why we're using them now, but you know, we'll, they're too expensive for us to continue using them. So if anyone from Kickbox is here, like, come talk to us and give us a discount. That would be great. <laughs> uh, and then we won't build our own. Uh, domain <laughs> reputation. Um, this one's pretty straightforward. Inputs into domain ep reputation, age, um, if, if it's been seen, you know, conducting malicious activity or C2 traffic or whatever, traffic rankings. There are, there's no shortage of domain reputation services out there. Um, here's a list. If you want, I'll send this to you later. Front end stack. So what else can we learn about this domain that's, that, um, that, we're, that we're looking at? Is it running ad trackers? Is it running Google Ads, Google Tag Manager, Google Analytics, Marketo, Optimizely? Does it have SEO meta tags? What can, we def what can we identify here that is representative of a legitimate domain versus a phishing domain or an attacker domain? These are all things that we can use to build a reputation profile. There are tools for this that are API-driven, Wappalizer, built with. There's plenty of tools for that. Site profiles. So when we broke down our list of positive inputs, we, uh, we had up there that we're looking at social media profiles and we're looking at business profiles. There are three ways that we do this. Uh, we're looking, we, we have a bunch of automated techniques for this. And we'll break down a bunch of those in just a second and how you could literally do it yourself. Um, and we'll do a live demo of that too. Um, data partnerships. So we have some data partnerships there and third party enrichments. So we'll, we'll break down the first one. So um, anybody remember like the, the classic vulnerability, information disclosure vulnerability from like the 90s or early 2000s where you could enter someone's username or, or um, email address and it'll tell you invalid username or invalid password and you could use that to enumerate accounts. Anybody remember that? Yeah. Um, so that, um, so, that, so that, that vulnerability actually is still very much alive and well, just not where you would expect. So let's do, uh, let's do a quick demo. So we're gonna, we're gonna pick on last.fm here. can't see that, can you? Let's see if I can uh, duplicate my display here. 
we go. All right, cool. So instead of the classic login here, we're going to go to the join page. Oh, fuck. It's <laughs> classic. All right. Um, so let's pull up DevTools here. Jesus Christ. Um, and let's take a look at the email field. Let's, uh, let's reload. Let's clear our console. And let's try and sign up for an account. Oh, shit. What is this? <laughs> uh, did I spell that right? Let's try this again. Oh, yeah. I don't have an account with last name for them. Hey, there we go. Sorry. That email address is already registered to another account. Interesting. So let's take a look, and we can see the XHR go out, and we can literally see the response that you, that this email address is already registered to another account. Boom. So we just did um, a profile enumeration of Last.fm. You can do this with hundreds of fucking sites. It's everywhere. Very pervasive. Again. All right, so this, this is pervasive, right? So um, PayPal is vulnerable to this, Apple, Hulu, DigitalOcean, Linode, Facebook, like the, li the list literally goes on. We have a bunch of techniques for this that we've automated. Um, sometimes it's a little less straightforward, like there's XSRF tokens or things that you need to replay, um, but it's, it's totally doable. Um, and this is a conscious choice, I should make clear that like, this is, a, this is a trade off that organizations are making to improve the user experience, reduce you know, friction and sign up flows, um, and uh, we're just taking advantage of that. So there's obviously a limitation here. So we don't get the actual profile in a lot of cases. Sometimes we can, but um, even the mere existence of a profile on a site is, is an indicative of, um, of reputation. Gravatar. Uh, anyone know what Gravatar is? All right, so Gravatars are globally recognized avatars. You may not know, but you probably have a Gravatar. And uh, sites that you um, register online with will use your email address. You can go from avatar, you can go from email address to um, profile photo and some basic information about you, like a first name or last name. And that is indicative of reputation. So here we have um, an email address, here's Ian's email address, and we're going from email address to um, Gravatar. And you can't see my mouse, but you see a 200 there, and that means that the profile exists. LinkedIn, who knows about this view by email trick on LinkedIn? Oh, I'm about to blow your fucking minds. All right, uh, you can go from email address to LinkedIn profile. And we, we use this all the time. Uh, and it's literally, that's, that's the path right there. You can go from email address to LinkedIn profile. Sign a reputation. He's got a LinkedIn account. Web crawling. If you guys miss anything on the slides, just come talk to me after. I'll give you everything. Um, and it'll be online, too. Web crawling. So web crawling is, um, is an endeavor. It is a pain in the ass, uh, but it's necessary. It's necessary to ingest data, uh, draw relationships, and then profit. Be able to go from email address to profiles. That's how you do it. So we are going to do an experiment here. We're going to do this together interactively. So we're going to pretend that we have a LinkedIn crawler. There's plenty of these online, open source, GitHub. And we're crawling the internet right now. We're crawling LinkedIn. And we arrive at, randomly, we arrive at Ian Teal's profile here. So what we're going to do is we're going to extract entities from this profile. And we're going to start building our graph. So I'll start us off with the first node in our graph. We're going to call it full name Ian Teal. All right? 
Uh, what are some other entities that we can extract here? Anybody? Company, perfect, sublime security. Anything else? Uh, where you went to school, boom. Groups you're in, boom. You hear one over there? Location, boom, perfect. Connections, companies you follow, perfect. All right, so we're extracting entities because Ian's profile is set to public and we're gonna build, start building out our graph. So we have a node in the middle. We're gonna call this, um, uh, we're gonna assign a unique UUID to this profile for LinkedIn and we're drawing edges to this middle node here. All right, so we have one element of our graph. This is not connected to anything else right now. All right, let's move on to our next social media platform, Twitter. Uh, I'll start us off again. Username, Ian Teal. What else we got? Location, followers, domain, birthday. Brilliant, brilliant. So we're starting to build out, build out work history, boom, brilliant. We're starting to build out the next, um, the next nodes in our graph. So, so now we have a Twitter profile and we have nodes connected to this Twitter profile. This is also still disparate. It's not connected to anything else yet. All right, Gravatar. We got profile, we got full name. We're gonna start creating that. All right, one thing that we have not talked about is this profile photo here. So traditionally, you would think of um, taking a hash of this, of this profile photo. The problem with that is that cryptographic hash functions are not designed for, for um, this purpose, for you know, like our intended use. So a cryptographic hash function is designed such that a small change in the input of the original input source will result in a drastic change in the output hash. So for graph building, this is actually not what we want because when you create a profile on a site, um, you, the, the sites will do some kind of normalization, maybe they'll draw a circle on it, maybe they'll you know, resize it or whatever, and that means that we're gonna lose any ability to connect these things, to, these things together. So what we're gonna use instead is a perceptual hash function. So a perceptual hash function actually has the opposite effect of a cryptographic function. So a small change in the input will actually result in a small change in the output. So this is the property that we want. So let's, let's take a look at how this, this actually works. So we're gonna take Ian's email address and we're gonna pivot to Gravatar profile. And then we're gonna take an MD5 and then we're going to take an image hash. All right. Now let's do the same thing with all the other profiles. Y'all notice anything there? We have Gravatar, Twitter, and LinkedIn, MD5s, are completely different. And if we look at the image hashes, they're extremely alike. In fact, Gravatar and Twitter are exactly the same. So, if we, if we subtract these, we can get a, a similarity between these profile photos. So we have um, no difference between Gravatar and Twitter, and we have a distance of three between Twitter and LinkedIn. That's really small. That means that these are pretty much the same photo. So what do we do? We take these perceptual image hashes, and we're gonna refill our graph. We're gonna add this to our graph. We have perceptual for LinkedIn, perceptual for Twitter, and perceptual for Gravatar. All right, we got, we got all this fucking data, all right? What are we gonna do with this data now? Boom, we can create connections between disparate graphs now using perceptual image hashes and a distance between a, a, an acceptable distance between perceptual image hashes. We can gain some additional confidence there by connecting usernames, same username, same full name. Now, what does this allow us to do? We've now gone from 
email address to a pretty uh, sophisticated graph including a, an inception date, March 2011. Ian's been around on the internet for nine years. That is a high source of reputation. All right, let's talk about negative inputs. Reporting. So reporting is, is uh, critical to particularly the uh, secondary use case that we talked about, account takeover. So we provide, we have a, a email rep has a report API that allows you to report suspicious behavior. We have a bunch of tags that you can use to um, specify exactly what the behavior was that you saw. We'll talk about what these actually mean and the implications of this, and then we will be um, releasing these on queries. We'll be returning these for any reported um, email addresses. We don't do that yet, but we will, we will be doing that. So community is really important for us. Um, we get a lot of reports on Twitter. Shout out to Actor Expose and Dubstart, who report a bunch of malicious email addresses. Fishing kits, shout out to Jay Cybersec. He's hunting down fishing kits all day. And Neon Primetime, um, so when they, when they see something, we're, we're able to uh, ingest some of those. And organizations and MSSPs, so these are the white knights. We have a lot of organizations that are looking at phishing emails all day and are reporting uh, malicious ones and their associated behavior. Uh, some more negative input. So uh, Sublime, as an email security platform, we see phishing attacks all the time. When we have confidence um, that something is an attack, we'll report those back to email rep. Uh, dark web credential leaks and compromises and uh, recent data breaches. We talked about that earlier. Let's talk about blacklisting. So um, it's, it's really important. One thing to emphasize here is that email address blacklisting is very tough. Um, and the way you do this correctly is to ensure temporality, to ensure that when something is risky, it's temporally risky for some time window. Um, and the reason, it, particularly for high reputation email addresses, is because these could be somebody's actual email address. And uh, for that point in time, that time window, they are malicious because they've been taken over. It's not actually them. So tags are critical inputs into this, uh, it's particularly risk ex expiration. So we have a threat actor tag. If you get hit with a threat actor tag, you're pretty much always going to be blacklisted uh, because this means that you're exclusively losing, you are the exclusive owner of this email address and it's not associated with a normal person. Account takeover is the opposite. So this is a legitimate person and it's temporally bad for a particular window of time. We can use reputation as an input into this, so if the email address is high reputation, then we can assume that it's been a, a taken over and we can have a lower blacklisting or, or a suspicious window. Uh, another thing that we're very careful about um, in our API response is the difference between suspicious and blacklisted. So at the top level of our response, we return a suspicious flag, and then we, re then we uh, break down exactly why it's suspicious. So the reasons could be blacklisted, they could be reported, or things like that. And as a defender, it's really important to know how to, to leverage that. So just because something is you know, suspicious or risky doesn't mean that you drop the, drop the message, right? Like it's, it's all context dependent. Is it, is it a message? Is there a suspicious link? You use these different inputs into into your decision-making process. All right, let's talk about scoring. So we talked about all these different positive and negative inputs. We're gonna synthesize all that, and we're gonna assign weights to um, the data based off of the difficulty of faking the data. So we call this proof of reputation. Literally just made that up. And um, it's, uh, it's how difficult it is to fake the data. So how difficult is it to um, create a fake Facebook account or a LinkedIn account or a Twitter account? How difficult is it to fake that you were in a data breach five years ago? That's hard, right? So that is a high source of reputation. 
All right, let's talk about some of the data that we see. I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I have no idea why the fuck this data is the way it is. And if somebody could explain this to me, that would be fantastic. Um, so just to break this down, 10%, so let, let's start with Twitter here. So 18% of all email addresses queried have just a Twitter account. This is like slightly explainable, okay, because a lot of security people just have Twitter accounts, like they create, you know, throwaway accounts or whatever. Why the fuck is Pinterest second? 10% of all of our queries only have a Pinterest account. Not only that, 50% of them are coming from Tor. <laughs> Somebody please tell me why this is. Is there anyone from Pinterest here that can explain this behavior? Nobody, nobody, all right. Well, we tried to contact Pinterest. We think there's some kind of shady shit going on. There's definitely some kind of underground hacker ring. I don't know what it is, but there's something going on there. Yeah. <laughs> no idea. Absolutely no idea. Uh, this is kind of interesting. So um, here's a reputation distribution of free email providers. So. 62% uh, of free email providers that are queried have high reputation, and 22% have no reputation. That's kind of interesting, kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know why this is interesting, but I just felt like I had to throw it up here. Um, I don't know why Russians are using FreeBSD and OpenBSD so much, but I don't know, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> we get a lot of requests from Russia. Um, we also get a lot of abuse. We get a lot of abuse. A wise man once said, sometimes free just ain't free enough. That was me. I said that. I said that. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is what abuse looks like. This is our uh, normal request volume. Uh, everything besides that spike, obviously. You can see the attackers doing a little test run there. And uh, you can see them going full steam ahead on January 12th. Uh, so quick side note, active IPs. So yeah, during this, during this um, period, we saw like literally hundreds of thousands of IPs. So I don't know where this person is getting that many IPs from, but I'd like to know. So let me, uh, let me know about that. Uh, request by country. So you can tell very clearly that during these abuse periods, we're seeing a high volume specifically from South Korea. We never really saw anything from South Korea. Um, so that's uh, kind of interesting. So uh, countermeasures, countermeasures. So we profile, we began profiling requests. And uh, I'm not going to reveal to you guys how we did that, because I don't want to have to rebuild the whole fucking process. But when we have 100% certainty, we serve fake data. So we don't always 403, we sometimes 403, but the only way to, to really fuck with them is to start serving fake data, because you know, they don't know what they're getting. We had to uh, reduce the unauthentic unauthenticated limit. Uh, we started doing a bunch of IP blacklisting, so shout out to Gray Noise for that. Um, interesting fact that 30, 20 to 30 percent of the requests that we were getting from this uh, attacker was um, was seen scanning the internet, was seen in gray noise. So what does that mean? These are this is probably a botnet. So gray noise was incredibly helpful for that. Uh, shout out to IP info as well. And then we started doing anomaly detection. Don't ask me what the fuck this query is doing. Because I couldn't tell you, but Ian over there is in the back, and he can he can give you a breakdown. Uh, the TLDR is that uh, every hour we are looking at the previous hour's activity, and we are looking for an anomaly in that request period. So ever since we instituted these um, mechanisms, countermeasures, uh, we're getting a lot of key requests. So we get five to ten per day. Um, we have about a 50% rejection rate, so um, 
we decide not to give keys to 50% of the requests because they look sketchy as hell. There's a lot coming from Russia um, and other places. There are a lot of low, no reputation. We have a, only about 5% contest. So that tells us that we're doing a good job because if, it's, uh, if it was a legitimate person, they would contest. 67% uh, of these are from free email providers. So like, how else would you know? Um, we have a principle at Sublime, so we use humans at the part of the process where they can add the most value, and we automate everything else. So we've literally automated the entire key approval process. Um, and so what happens is uh, we, have, we, we first instituted a CAPTCHA on the free key request page. That request will hit, we'll, we'll do a post to Zapier. If you're not familiar with Zapier, get hip to Zapier, because it will save you hundreds of hours of, of, of uh, work. Um, we hit Zapier with the email address. The Zap will then get the email reputation. It'll check our Slack channel for duplicates. Then it'll post to Slack with all that information. Then we have a second Zap that listens for an emoji reaction to that uh, post. And if we give it a little check mark or a little smiley face, then we'll generate a new key and it'll send them an approval email with all the information that they need docs and everything with their key. If we give them a nice little X um, or middle finger, then we send them a rejection email. This whole thing's an automated. So this is what it looks like. This is our Slack ping. It's got all the information we need. We have full visibility into the process. So when we give them that middle finger, uh, we see exactly what's going on. There's a rejection notification. Uh, we see this is a, an approved request. So we got high reputation, it's been in a data breach, but not recently, and there's the visibility, we sent them the key. If you want to know exactly how this works, go bother Ian after the talk. All right, use, use email rep. So there's plenty of ways to use it if it sounds interesting to you. Um, so we got a really simple API, we got a Python wrapper, we have a PowerShell wrapper, shout out to Kyle Parrish for that. We got an R wrapper, shout out to Bob Rudis for that. We got a Hive Cortex Analyzer and a browser extension. Shout out to Nino Secchi for that. We got an Auth0 integration. Shout out to Matthias Conrad for that. Probably butchered your name, I'm sorry. Uh, Office 365, shout out to Kick Ash for that. Uh, email rep in use. So we are obviously using it for phishing defense. Uh, Socks are using it for IR and uh, Steam alert enrichment, fraud, uh, account creation, sign up, check out, red teams, account discovery, profile enumeration, prioritization, that's what I would use it for if I was still doing uh, pen testing, uh, lead demo funnel, validation and prioritization. A lot of people are actually using it for this. It's pretty much our free key request use case here. Uh, future stuff, so um, we wanna improve our account takeover use case. So this is basically is bringing, bringing in more data. So more info on credential leaks, more info on you know, mouse spam, phishing, and that, all that good stuff. There's a lot of hot ML stuff that we could do with this, uh, TM on that. Um, we'll, be, uh, we'll be releasing a bunch of other free APIs. So uh, as, a, as a platform, um, we're building these APIs for Sublime and we're gonna open all those up for free. So the next one that we're building is a logo recognition API, so we use that for brand impersonation. Uh, if that sounds interesting, hit me up, we'll get you an early access for that. The biggest thing is reducing costs significantly, like 10X, because we need to handle very high volumes. Um, so that's, like, that's the main thing that we're gonna be doing. Uh, hit me up if you got any of this stuff breach data. Um, I would love to stop pounding your sign-up pages, so if you got an API I can use, uh, hit me up for that. Um, credential leak data, social profile data, if you run a spam trap or something, hit me up for that. Alright, uh, live demo. So we got a few minutes. Um, did anybody send an email? Alright, let's see here.
let's start with this one. <laughs> All right, so this one was actually blacklisted, yeah. So this one was reported by, um, I think, uh, actor expose. So let's just break down what this looks like. So this email was seen acting maliciously, um, what is that, like five days ago? And it has no other footprint on the internet. So if we dig into this response here, we got um, suspicious true, one reference, that's gonna be the report here. Um, and the last, re last scene here is uh, 2020, and uh, no profiles or anything like that. Uh, domain reputation is not applicable because it's a free email provider. All right, let me, uh, let me just pause there. Uh, does anybody have any questions? All right. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Let me see if I can. The uses? This one? Yeah. Okay, so the question was, what are we gonna do about um, rent, uh, the, the app, sign in with Apple logins? Um, so are those unique per, per, uh, per profile or per, per sign, yeah, per profile? Um, I don't know what we're gonna do about that, to be completely honest with you. Yeah, haven't thought about that. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yeah. Um. Uh, so the, let me know if I got this right. So the question was, have we considered returning arbitrary status codes to abuse behavior? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We do that. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yes, ma'am. A uh, couple questions um, from use cases I know. So one is Amelia Actors done a lot of amazing work on uh, fake profiles and bot-driven profiles online, uh, a lot of which very much make use of using the same username over and over again, using the same images over and over again. I'm wondering how you've um, worked that into your ranking, because I'm assuming you've, you've dealt with that. Second question is a little bit more confusing. Come again with the first question yeah. one more time. Um, what are you doing to incorporate what we already know about bot-driven profiles and fake profiles that are out there? Because I know you're using Twitter profiles, Facebook profiles, stuff like that. How are we incorporating known bots? Into, well, known bot-driven accounts into your ranking. Ah, okay. Uh, we're not right now. Okay. Yeah. Then um, you do. Yeah. Um, there was also a second thing. So I own gandrews at gmail.com, which is an absolute cesspit of the worst uh, internet toxic waste you can possibly find. It's all sorts of people leaking shit to me that they shouldn't. And one of the things I found is that, um, through that I found out that Facebook actually will sign the same email, Gmail address up twice for uh, a Facebook account if they use the period. So like we all know that Google will separate out accounts, well not separate out accounts that use periods or plus signs and other things, like that's all the same account. Mm -hmm. um, other services don't do that same thing. So for example, like we've got two gandrews at gmail.com accounts because of this, because somebody signed this account yeah. up for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it wasn't even me either, like this is not actually associated with anything else. I just used your site to look up gandrews at gmail.com and there's accounts on Spotify and Last.fm. I didn't do those and that, from what my data, looks like it could be hundreds of other gandrews's, so we don't actually know who this is, because there's there seems to be some sort of garbage in the system there. So so they are using your email address to sign up for profiles on other accounts? And actually getting access, yeah, because there's there's some hinkiness sometimes about whether they're allowed to get through and begin to create the account in a public way. Interesting, interesting, yeah. So what's the, what's the motivation for creating accounts uh, without owning the email address? In this case, it seems to be ignorance. Um, people are doing it by accident, not understanding that it's not their email account. I see, so, I see. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a really good point. So one of the ways that we handle f specifically for Gmail and G Suite accounts, so we will try and normalize those as best as we can for our lookups, and sometimes we'll make multiple lookups. So if we know, so we'll do an MX lookup on domains that are queried, and, and if we see that it's a Google MX, if it's G Suite, then we will actually do reputation checks 
Like if, if it comes in with a plus, we'll truncate the plus. We'll replace dots. Um, we do a bunch of shit to try and prevent that and, and uh, make the data better. Well, yeah. that's interesting because that will actually then end up losing accounts that are out there under those other things as well. So yeah, so we, yeah. we have to be careful about like, yeah, which, which sites actually uh, accept, you know, lo like those types of logins, which ones actually strip those out right. and yeah, create one account. Yep, totally. Thank you. All right, I'm out of time. Um, come talk to me after. All right, thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. Oh, free keys, free keys. Uh, free keys for Shmoo. Uh, it's only today. Um, it has double the rate limit as usual. So uh, yeah, take that.